Hey guys, so today we're going to be looking at uh, managing memory. More specifically, we're going to be focusing on how virtual memory addresses are mapped to physical memory addresses, um, what sort of handles that as part of the operating system, how that memory looks in memory and at, a, at a high level, um, and we're also going to look at things like segmentation, um, we're going to look at fragmentation, paging, and different approaches to paging and different things we can do um, for that. So let's get straight into it. So I'm going to start with address translation. So address translation with this, the hardware transforms the memory access. So every single memory access operation, whether that's a read, whether that's a write, um, we change the virtual address in the instruction to a physical address. So um, every program sort of has its own private memory. <coughs> and <coughs> in that program's private memory, it has its own code and it has its own data. And it has its own memory addresses for that specific program. Now, it's up to the operating system through a process which we call virtualization to map these virtual private memory addresses to hardware physical memory addresses that the entire system shares. Um, and it does that through a series of different ways. Um, and we'll explore how it does that. If there are any questions throughout as well, just drop them in the chat. So. Sometimes you might see the term memory management unit, MMU, chucked around. Um, this is just the part of the processor that helps with address translation. Um, and usually it's like a physical component that's part of the CPU, um, but it just helps with that address translation. Um, but it's part of the CPU. So starting with this, I just want to look at how sort of the memory of a process might be stored. <coughs> so a process consists of three parts in memory. Um, and those three parts are the actual program itself, so the program code, and then it has the heap, and then it has the stack. So if we think about the heap, what, what sort of stuff does a program have that's stored on the heap? Okay, good. So so we've got um, dynamically allocated memory. Yep, global variables. Okay, good. So anything that's stored on the heap is things like um, static... That's a horrible color. Um... So things like static variables um, and anything that's like dynamically allocated. Um, and then in the stack, we have our sort of, st not static, in the stack, we have our, um, well, yes, by by static, I mean like not dynamic, but that's not, okay, that's not very clear. Um, but we have things that are defined on the stack, like just local variables, variables within functions, things like that, um, as well as like our program calls and um, stack frame. So... The heap is going to grow this way. Um, we have it growing sort of downwards or in increasing memory addresses. And typically we have our stack in decreasing memory addresses. So our stack grows this way and our heap grows this way. And all of this space is essentially that process's address space. It's specifically for that program. <coughs> so this is what the virtual address space looks like. Now, in our overall computer, like in our entire, um, in our entire system, that process is just this part here um, and this could be used by other processes this could be used by other processes and our operating system needs some base amount of memory to run so so overall um, we have we have all of this and we have a lot of space here that we could use for something and a lot of space here and all of this space here is allocated um, for this process but it's not being used because the heap and stack haven't grown that big yet now Segmentation is where we can prevent the the waste of memory. So we can prevent wasting this little chunk of memory here. Now, we know data is mutable. It's going to change every instance. <coughs> Program code is immutable. It's going to be the same for each instance. And the symbol table, so these are things like um, variables that are fixed, um, they're immutable. They're the same for each instance. Um, and we typically only use them for debugging. Um, Okay, not exactly variables, but just general symbols for the program that we might use. Now, instead of having one contiguous chunk of memory that we reserve for that program or that process, um, the idea of segmentation is having a base and bounds pair for every single logical segment of the address space. Um, and all this means is instead of having our program here and then another program here and another program here, we can sort of split this up. Like we can have parts of the program scattered around memory. Um, and when we have base bounds pairs, that essentially means we we essentially have blocks of memory which we can address um, and it just makes it more granular and easier to 
target a specific part of memory as opposed to just having a whole chunk of memory for an entire program. Um, so this is a, another diagram I've sort of got to represent that. <coughs> Here, you'll notice compared to the other diagram where there's allocated but not in use memory, there's no allocated memory here that's not in use. Everything is either allocated and being used, or it's not in use, meaning something else can come and grab that, that memory. Now, this is typically how we'd store the locations of the different things. So for example, the code is based at 32 KB. This is just a, a memory address. It's based at 32 K and the size is 2K. So it extends 2K. Heap is based at 34 K and it extends 3K and our stack is based at 28k and it extends 2k and remember our stack extends upwards so now instead of the heap and stacks sort of going into each other they're opposing each other meaning they have way more space to grow um, and so this is what it looks like if we try and use segmentation to store processes in a in a more efficient way where we can then use this memory some for something else we can use this memory for something else and this for something else and we're not restricting that just for a specific process now if our memory demand is too high, so if, if our overall memory is quite full or it's getting quite full, we can transfer some of the memory of some of these processes to the disk. Now, obviously on the disk, things are gonna be a lot slower because read write operations, we have to move a disk head in a hard drive or um, overall it will just take a, a lot longer than it would take to just communicate with memory, which is directly attached to the CPU. Um, and we usually, we usually um, combine swapping with scheduling, so we might not just use it for memory, but also for scheduling processes, where we um, swap low priority processes out of the CPU. Um, but that will be covered more in the CPU scheduling session. Now, when we swap, so, so we swap some stuff out to the disk. Now, you might be wondering, how do we decide what to swap out, or how do we decide where to allocate certain things in memory? And there's a few different approaches we can take. There's a few different strategies we can take to choose where in memory you want to store something. So I'm just going to draw out <coughs> a very basic. Let's imagine this is memory and if there's an X, that means it's been allocated to something else. Um, right. So our first strategy, first fit. Can anyone tell me in chat what is the first fit strategy? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, perfect. So first fit, we start from the beginning and we use the first available hole or use the first available memory space that has enough size. Um, so let's say whatever we're storing is just one block, um, one block big. I'm actually going to move this here and get rid of this. Okay, so we want to store something that's one block big. Now, all we do is we just look for the first hole. We look at this one. Oh, it's free. Okay, let's take that one. So that's first fit. If we have something like two blocks, we just look at the first, realize that that's not big enough, this isn't big enough, and then we'd find this and store it here. So, um, so as Ash said, it's the first available memory space that has enough size for the allocation. Now, the next one is rotation first fit. So what's the difference between first fit and rotation first fit? Yeah, cool. So instead of using the first space from the start of memory, you start the last place where we allocated. Yeah, exactly. So start from the last assigned part of memory. So what that looks like is if we, again, if we have something like one block, first we'll store it here. Um, then the next block we store, um, obviously this is the first available hole, so we take this. But then if this is deallocated later on, um, and then we want to store another block, we're not going to store it here. We're going to carry on from where the last thing we stored was and carry on from there. So even if things are deallocated up here and there's something available earlier on in memory, um, we still just carry on from where we were. So we maintain a pointer as to where the last um, allocated memory is and just carry on from there. And it's it's sort of called rotation because we rotate round memory instead of just sticking to, sticking to that. <coughs> oh yeah, Ash, it might also be referred to as next fit. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind as well. Cool. Um, what about best fit? What does what does best fit do? How does that decide where to where to choose? Yep, good ash. So best fit, we find the smallest usable space that has enough memory to store the allocation size. So this may not be the best example, <coughs> but let's say we had okay. Let's say we had something like this, and we wanted to store one block now. We could store it here, 
we could store it here, we could store it here, we could store it here. But best fit, we'll choose this slot here because it's the big, it's, it's the smallest possible hole that's big enough to store what we need to store. We're not going to store it here because then that wastes potentially a two block being stored here. Um, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And finally, buddy system. So this was, I think there was just a sentence or two on this in the lecture, but what would the buddy system, how, how do we think this works? Or how do we, what can we recall about this? Okay, perfect, yeah. So so this might be referred to as a binary buddy system, um, but <coughs> I'll just refer to it as a buddy system for, for today. Um, and so the idea is we split memory into, we split memory into sizes that are holes of two to the power of something so let's say initially every hole is just is that eight no that's nine okay let's say initially every hole is just one one block big um then we might if we want to store something that's maybe two blocks then we want to merge holes until we have something that's two blocks so this for example um and then we can store it in there um as soon as we don't need that anymore we can split the hole um Actually, no, no, no. Okay, so if we want to store something that's two blocks, we'd merge two holes and store it in here. If you want to store something that's four blocks, uh, we'd merge these and then merge that and then store it in here. So note that the hole is always two to the power of something in size, um, in the number of bits. So what this achieves is it means we can minimize sort of the amount of wasted space and it creates a tree-like structure, as Ash said, to reduce fragmentation and simplify coalescing. Um, what do you mean by coalescing, Ash? So we have a definition of that. What about when the program needs three blocks? Ah, right. So this this is a potential issue where we have wasted space. We have that internal fragmentation. If we don't need two to the power of something blocks, then obviously this space here is wasted because it's still merged into this. Um, but it, it's sort of so that we can um, recursively free and merge blocks. Um, you know about the free list basically when you free memory it joins two free places that are contiguous into one yeah so so obviously if you want two more blocks here then we'd look for these two consecutive places that are big enough and merge them into one um and then if we if we want to store one block then we can find something that's been sort of deallocated and split that up if if necessary and so it means we can have more granular memory sections but obviously with that downside of if it's something like three, then we're wasting a quarter of the space that that's allocated for that. But anyway, yeah, so that's buddy system. Have holes in size of power of two. We use the smallest possible hole. If there's um, uh, something we want to store that's smaller than the size of the smallest hole, then we can split a hole in two. Um, and we can reconduct, recombine two adjacent holes of the same size. So we can't recombine holes that are different sizes. Now, fragmentation. So moving on to fragmentation. Swapping raises two problems, as it's been mentioned in the chat. So over time, many small holes will appear in memory. This is external fragmentation. And then programs may only require memory that's slightly smaller than the size of a hole, and the leftover is too small to qualify as a hole, causing internal fragmentation. So the point you raised, Mustafa, about the buddy system being prone to higher fragmentation is correct. Um, it would be prone to higher internal fragmentation, but external fragmentation wouldn't sort of occur as prominently because we avoid those gaps and we try and make space of uh, make make use of that space um yeah exactly so so that moves me on to paging now paging is another alternative approach um it's a way we can sort of implement swapping or a way we can do swapping with um with which allows us to avoid external fragmentation so many small holes appearing over time in memory. Now, with paging, we assign memory of a fixed size. Uh, this is typically called a page. You might even see on some Linux distros, I'm not sure how it works on Windows, where you create something called a page file or a swap file. And this is basically on your disk. It's, it's literally a file on your disk. And when we run low on memory, we can store some of the data in that file. So it will store some of that data on the disk. Now. Obviously, reading and writing to the disk is a lot slower than memory. <coughs> so it's good to avoid this where possible. If, if we can just download more, no, if we can buy more RAM, obviously that's better than trying to 
store stuff on the disk because the read write speeds are going to be a lot slower if we're trying to communicate with some sort of external device as opposed to just communicating with memory through the memory bus and the data bus directly now the when we do store stuff on disk the translation of logical or virtual memory addresses to these physical addresses is done via something called a page table so a page table lets us record where each virtual page of the address space is placed in physical memory and the OS usually keeps a per process data structure uh, known as a page table. So if we have um, a bunch of processes, let's say this is a, a browser, if we have Discord, each of these are going to have their own table, which the OS is keeping track of. And 0x0, 0x1, 0x2. And it's going to have some sort of corresponding page number um, that's the actual physical page number. So both of these processes are going to have their own idea of what memory address zero is. And this might point to 0x34, this might point to 0x42. So even though both of them can manipulate whatever's in address zero of their virtual memory, they map to different physical memory locations. And so that's, that's this illusion that the OS provides, that's this abstraction of virtualization. So so yeah, we keep a per process data structure known as a page table. And the main role of this page table is to store address translations. And they tell us where each virtual page of the address space resides in physical memory. <coughs> now, sometimes what we're trying to look up won't be in memory because of it being sort of swapped out or stored in the page file on disk. So if our page table tells us what we're looking for is on the disk, this causes a page fault exception. And so this means that we have to then look on the disk or we have to handle this exception. And whatever's calling or whatever's looking up this memory address then has to handle that exception. Now, we can tune how paging works and how swapping works. There's something called page replacement policies. So the OS is faced with a bunch of different options when deciding what to swap in or swap out of memory. Now, just to be clear, swap in is when we move something from disk to RAM. So imagine this is our RAM, um, this is our disk. Swapping in is when we move something from RAM to disk. So there's space in memory, or we want to load something from the disk into memory. So we swap it into memory. And then swapping out is when we move it out of memory onto the disk. So this is our, um, oh no, our RAM's too full. Let's store some of this on disk. Um, whereas this is, oh, we need to use something quite frequently and our RAM's got space for it, so let's swap it into RAM. Um, yeah, so the OS has a bunch of different options. When do we swap in? When do we swap out? Should we have some sort of threshold? Do we want to wait till RAM's completely 100% full, or maybe when it's like 50% full or 80% full? Now, this process is known as the page replacement policy, um, when we're deciding what to kick out or what to bring in. And so this can be tuned. There's loads of different parameters that we can tune for this, loads of different configurations. And this depends heavily on the context of usage. But um, page replacement policies are very, very important because if they're slightly offset, it can lead to huge, um, huge like negatives. It can lead to significant increases in how long it takes to run a program or run a game. And so it's very important that these replacement policies are fine-tuned and they're very, very specific and specialized to what we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, we've also got a mention of thrashing from Ashbury. So if these page replacement policies are not sort of optimally set, um, something called thrashing can occur. I believe this will be covered as well in a future session in more detail. But can anyone tell me in chat what, what is thrashing? Okay, too many swaps that shall it bottlenecks the system's normal performance. Yeah, good. So... Um, there's a lot of different definitions, but um, how I like to refer to thrashing is when the system spends more time doing this than actually doing useful computations. Um, instead of actually talking to the CPU and doing anything useful, it's wasting more time swapping in and swapping out of memory. And that's usually a symptom of your RAM being too small or your page replacement policy is just being very poorly defined. So we want to avoid that wherever possible. Okay. Um, that's everything I want to cover in today's session. Again, like I said, a lot of the stuff around resource management will be covered in future sessions. But are there any questions about anything that I've talked about today? Cool. Um, so thanks for coming to the session. If you're on YouTube and you have any questions, just drop a comment. Um, hope you found this useful.